So this is my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dave Murrow this morning. And so just for the anecdote, Dave uh, has been uh, in the Space Challenge family for, for a while now because he was involved with uh, previous editions. It has been a juror. It has been, he has been um, a lecturer in the past. So really exciting to have uh, Dave with us again uh, for this 2019 edition of the Space Challenge. So Dave Murrow has spent 30 years researching, proposing, designing, and operating space opera uh, exploration missions. His career has included uh, seven flight missions, so quite, quite a big number. Uh, he received awards for his work on um, Galileo, Cassini, Mars Climate Orbiter, Mars Polar Lander, Stardust, and Genesis. He has been involved in future planning for human spaceflight, notably for future Orion missions to the Moon and Mars. So really uh, a, a dual, kind of a dual profile, uh, a robotic exploration, human exploration, very interesting. And um, so Dave Murrow received his Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Colorado in 1984 and a Master of Science uh, as well from Colorado in uh, 1987. So he worked a bit at the UT Center for Space Research in Earth Gravity Model Development and then he joined JPL in 1987. And he was involved with the, the Galileo uh, launch and early cruise phase. And what is interesting to uh, the participants uh, uh, even more is that uh, he was the Cassini mission systems engineer. And so he developed the requirements, a spacecraft operational scenario, and concept to maximize the science return. So you can get some uh, good information for your mission concept. So I encourage you to talk to, to Dave. Uh, it was the mission design lead for the Mars uh, 98 project and was the launch manager for three successful launches between December 1998 and February 1999, so which included the Mars Climate Orbiter, Ma Mars Polar Lander, and Stardust. So then he has been in, uh, at Ball Aerospace uh, between 2000 2008, and now is currently a senior business development manager uh, for Lockheed Martin. So please uh, help me welcome uh, Dave Murrow uh, to give his exciting lecture about 50 years of planetary missions. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the introduction. I guess my, my first uh, lesson learned from that is that I've got to trim out the words. Uh, it, sounds like a, it, it sounds like bragging. It doesn't mean to be bragging because I'm sure in 35 or 40 years, you guys will have just as many experiences. Um, the, the field that we all have chosen to work in is, <clears throat> is very exciting, very fruitful. There's been a lot going on for a long time. And, and as you heard from uh, Tom and uh, Henry earlier on, there's a, there's a very bright future for, for what we can do. Um, the only thing that I will take issue with is that the been there, done that idea is, is uh, is, is true in, some, in, in the sense of first looking at something, but there's always more to learn. Um, never, never expect that the first time you've looked at something is the last time you need to look at it. There's always more data, always more analysis, always more uh, um, intelligence, artificial or not, that we can apply to, to these kinds of problems. So anyway, thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Fabian and, and Simon, for setting this up and for welcoming me uh, back to the space challenge. So. Um, so I'm in, uh, in business development nowadays. I used to be a, an engineer and uh, business development is kind of what we uh, think of in, in the industry as the folks that, you know, we try to understand what goes on in the world, what goes on in the rest of industry, who our competitors are. And one of the things that we focus on a lot these days is who our next generation of, uh, of real superstars is gonna be. Um, as you can tell from uh, both Tom and I, um, we're probably in the, um, the latter half of our careers. Um, you guys are certainly in the first half. And uh, so I hope I can uh, inspire you today with uh, not only what has been done, but um, what can be done and uh, give you a sense of where Lockheed Martin fits in the whole uh, space exploration ecosystem. DSC, I'll just explain, is, uh, is the uh, acronym for, for what I get to do. It's called Deep Space Exploration. So uh, what a great thing for us to all be involved in. Um, 
And just over here, there's just a few things that we've done. I'll talk a lot about these as we go down the path of this presentation. <clears throat> one of the things I have, I have a lot of slides um, and I'll talk as much as I uh, can on each one, uh, probably focusing a little more on the engineering side than the science. Um, and then uh, you can save your questions for the end. Although if it's a burning question, I'm not uh, averse to sort of stopping and being a little flexible as we go. And also I'll be around this afternoon if you have any more questions uh, as we go forward. So uh, with that, let me just jump right in. Let's see, clicker. Let me just, hmm. I suppose I could stand behind the, uh, ah, there we go. There we go. Yeah, it's a, which, which just goes to show you these, these things, these projects, all projects start with a, with a brilliant idea like what we heard about before. But at the end of the day, the engineering execution really does matter. Um, so let me just tell you, this isn't meant to be a commercial about Lockheed Martin, but it is important to understand where we fit, I think, in the whole scheme of things. Um, Lockheed Martin is a, is a very large company. We do uh, a lot of different things for uh, uh, the military, um, for uh, the government, national defense, things like that. In my area, we're, uh, we're a uh, part of the company called Lockheed Martin Space. Um, we have four different main areas of the company, aeronautics, uh, mission solutions, and then uh, we build helicopters too, uh, rotary mission systems, we call that, because you couldn't just call it the helicopter division. Um, the, uh, so in Lockheed Martin space, I work in the uh, commercial civil space area where what we've done is combine um, all of the things that are essentially non-military, non non-national uh, non uh, programs. So our customers there really are, are these shown over here. Got some international work, some commercial work. My particular area is deep space exploration. You can see some of the missions right here. Um, we also do human space exploration. Um, Orion is kind of our, our biggest program that's ongoing. You may be familiar with Orion. It's, it'll launch next year on an uncrewed flight to the moon. And then as soon as possible after that, once the rocket is ready and, and, and all the engineering has been done, uh, we'll launch humans to the uh, moon again for the first time since the 70s. And I've got a little graphic of what that mission looks like in a bit. Um, we also have uh, some of the SLS. This is the big rocket. Uh, and then uh, we're always coming up with new ideas for what Orion and what the f future human exploration can be. I want to say just one quick thing that distinguishes these two um, pieces of, of the exploration sort of uh, world uh, or universe, I guess I should say. Uh, the, the human spaceflight exploration, we all understand is, is sort of necessary to keep people engaged and involved and understanding and excited about what we do in space exploration. Um, unfortunately or not, you know, not everybody is as brilliant as you all in here. Not everybody understands the science and is really driven by the passion. So one of the things that we, uh, we do is we, uh, we uh, connect with the, uh, with the world of uh, 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 you know, people to pay for it, frankly. And uh, so the human space exploration and the desire to actually put boots on the surface of the moon, that's one of the things that drives our program and drives the funding, drives the public interest, um, and allows the fact that we are out here kind of on the next wave um, uh, to be able to do what we, what we wanna do and can do. One key difference though is that with, with you know, and, and Tom talked about this a little bit, um, with this, the basic sensors and, um, and uh, um, command and data handling, if you will, the brains and the eyes of a human spaceflight exploration mission are essentially driven in size by us. So it's a six foot tall or five, eight in my case or whatever um, person that uh, has a fair amount of uh, support requirements required. Um, and, and so the scaling is different. We'll never be able to do tiny, tiny little missions with humans because humans aren't tiny, tiny. We will be able to, to extend our reach to, uh, to distant objects with tiny things um, by going into deep space and then by also looking um, at, uh, at the universe it helped with uh, things like Hubble and, uh, and, and CubeSats and things like that. But the basic difference here is that Human missions will always be sort of scaled by the size of the human in the system. Um, 
So uh, other stuff we do, here's uh, some of our weather satellites, GOES, that's geostationary weather satellites. All the weather data that you see um, comes from those satellites, and we've got two of them operational. They're called 16 and 17 now, and then T and U, they, they, they get letters before they launch and then numbers after they launch. Um, and we build a lot of instruments for those sorts of things. Um, and the instruments are really where a lot of the science and a lot of the, a lot of the difficult stuff happens. We build communication satellites. This is what brings your uh, television signals and your uh, cell phone signals and frankly gives you the chance to uh, fill up at a gas station and not go in and talk to the, uh, talk to the folks inside because you've put your card in and brought it back out. So, um, and then here, I hope you can see this behind the screen. There's some, we're, uh, we're, we're always doing research on mission enabling type architectures. CubeSats kind of fall into that. Marco, is, uh, as Tom mentioned, is one of the um, kind of key enablers of uh, potentially deep space um, exploration with, uh, with CubeSats. So there's where we fit. I'm gonna now go, th go into uh, um, what we've done in the planetary regime. So planetary missions, we started back in, uh, in the 60s and 70s. I actually call this 50 years of planetary exploration because of course we started the project to build the very first propulsion module for Mariner back in the 60s, 1968, 69 timeframe. We started that project. It actually went into orbit at Mars in 1971. That mission discovered that Mars has dust storms. That was kind of one of the key things. We arrived and there was Mars. It was covered with dust. That's a engineering design driver now that we have to worry about when we um, land on the, on the surface. You all may have seen Opportunity recently, and Opportunity um, kind of expired 15 years after it arrived because of a dust storm. So, uh, you know, it's data that um, we didn't know uh, all those years ago about Mars. We didn't know what the dust was. We, uh, we then proceeded with Viking. We, were the, uh, we built the entire Viking lander. That was pretty exciting. And, and one of the things I want to point out here is that uh, you know, Lockheed Martin, I said, is a big place, but um, most of this work um, was done in, uh, in Denver, Colorado. So Denver is really where the center of most of our planetary exploration is. There's some that gets done in Sunnyvale. Um, there's some that gets done in uh, Palo Alto. We've got advanced technologies there, but generally the mission level work we do is in Denver, Colorado. So uh, that's where I'm from. I flew in last night. Um, Magellan, radar mapping of Venus, then we did a bunch of Mars stuff. Mars Global Surveyor was a, a, a mission that looked at the, uh, well, it, as it says, it was a kind of a global weather and, um, and geological, geological uh, survey mission, um, looking down at the surface with this little thing you can see as a camera. Um, Lunar Prospector went to the moon. Stardust went to, the, went to comets. Um, Odyssey, Genesis, on around. Here's some more Mars missions. Phoenix went in uh, 2007 to land on Mars. Um, June, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Um, on out to the one we're building right now is called Lucy. Lucy is named after, here's an interesting sort of string of pearls for you. Lucy is named after the uh, fossil skeleton Lucy that was discovered in Africa in, uh, uh, in the 70s, I guess, was when Lucy was discovered. Um, Lucy, in turn, was named after a song that was popular at the time called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by the Beatles. So uh, anyway, this is all connected. Um, uh, Lucy, Africa, um, heritage, genetics, uh, discovery, and the Lucy mission will uh, explore the Trojan asteroids, which are some of the remnants of the primordial solar system. Again, I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, so I want to get into a little bit more details about just a few of our missions. Um, so this one is InSight. You all probably have uh, kind of heard of InSight as a mission. We landed on Mars in, um, uh, on Cyber Monday of last year. We actually launched on Cinco de Mayo and landed on Cyber Monday. So that means either that every day has a real cool name or we just picked the right mission planning to uh, have good names. Um, not sure which it is, but as you develop your mission, you might just look for what a good name is for the dates that you arrive. Incidentally, Viking was scheduled to land on July 4th of 1976, bicentennial of the United States of America. Unfortunately, because of a dust storm and some other uh, issues when we got there, it didn't actually land until later in the month. But um, we're always looking for those ties, again, to get the public excited and get the public interested. You all are, as I said, 
probably some of the smartest, brightest people will be on the cutting edge of the technology. But please never forget your role as an ambassador for what we do, as a spokesman for space science, and as a spokesman for the excitement we get from discovering things about our universe. So um, InSight um, landed, as I said, on Cyber Monday. It's a uh, very, it sort of it looks like Viking. It's a three-legged design with propulsive descent. I've got a video coming up in a second. Um, it follows on these missions. And one of the things that I'll point out uh, that came from my uh, bio, there was a mission that is not on our list of successes called Mars Polar Lander that we talked about, or that, that uh, um, Simon, or excuse me, Fabian had in my introduction. Um, we built Mars Polar Lander, we got it to Mars, we launched it successfully. Unfortunately, once it got to Mars, it wasn't successful during the landing. And one of the things I want to just say is that, uh, you know, this isn't always an easy thing. You wind up with successes and failures. Mars Polar Lander, I consider a success because of all we did. It didn't actually touch down and return science, so it doesn't get on the honor roll, but, um, but it certainly gets honorable mention. And so it was one of these as well, Phoenix and InSight. Um, are, are similar designs to what we flew with MPL. I, I personally call MPL the Mars prototype lander, um, just my own. Uh, anyway, um, and we're also working on taking this design and uh, going forward for uh, modifying it for lunar ex exploration. Um, you may have heard that the um, uh, vice president the other day at the National Space Council um, announced that we were gonna land humans on the moon in 2024. Um, our way of doing that, Lockheed Martin, we've been pushing, uh, pushing for that sort of thing for a long time. And uh, our way would, have, would take a lot of the, um, the command and data handling, the, uh, the, the verification validation techniques, the interaction with the surface of the planet, uh, the entry descent, and especially the terminal descent. Um, it would take a lot from landing on Mars. So Mars, Moon, obviously not the same, human, Robotic, obviously not the same scale, but there are many commonalities. And one of the things about being an engineer is seeing the commonality between problems as opposed to the differences. Um, so Phoenix, uh, or excuse me, so InSight lands, it's got two main instruments. This is a seismometer. It'll take, uh, um, essentially listen for uh, seismic waves from moonquakes. You all here at Caltech in, uh, in Pasadena are very familiar with seismometry. Um, and then this is a, a thermal probe that'll go down uh, 15 feet and has uh, sensors along the length of it here to measure the heat um, that happens at very, in the time duration or the time series of the heat measurements. Um, what, what we wanna do with this essentially is that with, with Mars exploration programs in the past, we've found a lot about the surface, we found out a lot about the atmosphere, and we can infer some things about the, the interior of Mars, but this is the first mission that will, re that will really sample um, or take direct measurements of uh, the interior of Mars. I shouldn't say sample because that's actually another mission, sample return, um, that we can talk about if you, in the Q&A if you have questions. Um, so let me go to the next uh, chart, and this is a, just, just an animation. I'll just narrate this. So this is seven minutes of terror um, because you know the, the uh, Mars atmosphere is very thin. So uh, we first uh, were on our, on our cruise. Um, we do the EDL, JPL obviously does the mission management, and so it's a very collaborative effort. So that's what the spacecraft looks like, um, all buttoned up, we call it, inside the aeroshell. And this piece here is called the cruise stage. You can see a couple of star trackers that, um, and then that cruise stage gets um, jettisoned after the spacecraft is pointed in the precise attitude to go into the atmosphere. Um, there it says precision is critical. Um, it, it burns up um, sp at the outside of the aeroshell. It's a, called an ablative aeroshell. Um, so the energy transfer um, happens because the uh, aeroshell burns up and parts of it come, come out. Um, as it goes through, about 70% is taken out by the heat shield, 70% of the energy. The uh, parachute deploys. Um, takes out more of the energy from the uh, direct entry. <clears throat> and then the heat shield uh, is jettisoned because the uh, ballistic coefficient is different. The uh, spacecraft, uh, the heat shield falls away. Then we deploy the landing legs, uh, acquire with the radar and fire engines, um, as you can hear, uh, in our terminal descent phase. So here's it traveling to the ground, slows down to about five miles an hour. 
and touches down on the surface. So that is what happened on Cyber Monday. It unfurls its solar arrays um, and then takes uh, selfie pictures. You can see here is the uh, um, seismometer and back over here is the mole, uh, which is the, uh, which is the uh, thermal probe I, I spoke about. And then of course the obligatory Lockheed Martin. So uh, I, I will say one more thing about Lockheed. I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world because you know, a lot of companies go in and out of exploration missions. Um, we're all businesses and um, we wanna do things that are exciting, but we also have to make money to stay in business because we have shareholders, it's our system, right? And so uh, one of the things that's, uh, that I find great about the company I work for is that we've stuck with the exploration side. We built Hubble, we built Spitzer, um, and we build all these planetary missions in addition to all the other programs that we do. So, uh, you know, other companies do this, uh, um, uh, some. Boeing does a lot of human space exploration. So there are other companies out there. I feel lucky to work for Lockheed Martin. Partly because there's another mission that we have called OSIRIS-REx. So back in the uh, 80s, a fellow uh, that I worked with up at uh, uh, JPL, we, uh, we were lucky enough to work on the Galileo mission. Galileo, um, as it got redesigned after the Challenger failure that happened in 86, um, it ended up going um, on a different trajectory and we decided, you know, we've got to keep this thing exciting. Going through the asteroid belt uh, between Jupiter and Mars, um, we targeted the spacecraft to fly by an asteroid and we called that one Gaspra, or they called it Gaspra. Um, we wrote a paper on navigating by that asteroid back in the uh, 80s. Now we've been to uh, many, many small bodies. We, the larger exploration community, has been to many small bodies. And OSIRIS-REx is at um, uh, one called Bennu, which is uh, kind of the latest in the, um, in the, in the string of small body missions. Um, are, just to let you know that this is an international endeavor. We have a, a, a sort of a, not really a sister team, but another team in parallel in, in Japan doing a mission called Hayabusa 2. It's at an asteroid also, and it's taking samples as well, and we'll bring those back. Um, the objective of OSIRIS-REx, other than to uh, do as much as you can to make a, a, an acronym, um, it's a regolith explorer. Security is really about protecting the Earth from an uh, incoming asteroid. Um, the objective really is to return samples from this asteroid and to bring back, we think we'll bring back much more than 60 grams, but uh, that's, the, that's what has been committed to. Um, and uh, the key result to date really is that um, Bennu is, is, is active. You may have seen last week the PI Dante Loretta talked at a, at a conference. Bennu actually is active. Um, I don't actually, I've, I've got, this is a hyperlink to uh, the key result on nasa.gov. I won't go to that right now, but you guys can do it on your own time. And one of the things that we've seen out of Bennu is that um, uh, small rocks are being um, ejected. And so something inside Bennu as we go closer to the sun, it must be heated up and pushing the rocks out. So rocks are being ejected. Some of them are falling back down to the surface of the asteroid and some of them are going off and flying into space. We've actually, at Lockheed, what we do is we control the spacecraft. Um, the science team does most of the um, you know, science measurements and whatnot and they tell us what's really going on. But the, um, we've actually had to back the spacecraft away. Um, we were about a half a mile from the surface of the asteroid in orbit and um, we've, uh, we've had to back away a little bit just to keep ourselves safe from those, uh, those rocks. <clears throat> the other thing I'll mention is that this uh, touch and go sampler, I've got a little uh, animation of it in a second. Uh, the touch and go sampler is sort of designed to um, go down on a fairly um, flat open space, kind of like this area I'm standing in here, touch the surface of the asteroid, grab a sample, and come back up um, uh, so we don't endanger the spacecraft. Um, but as you can see uh, from the, um, oops, uh, let me go back. I guess I'm not gonna get that animation. As you can see from this um, uh, asteroid, it's all rocks. So we're having to think about how to do the touch and go sampling in a different way. So what we've learned, and this is why there's never a been there done that, um, all respect to people who've done everything, in, uh, who've done things in the past. You're always gonna learn something new. So never stop thinking, no, never stop thinking, you, or never stop and think you know everything. Um, the, uh, we've learned that Bennu is full of rocks. It's not one 
mass. It's uh, what we call a rubble pile. It used to be theorized rubble pile. It's held together by maybe Van der Waals forces. Remember those from undergraduate education? It, it's, held, it, it's, it's odd. It's just different. And that's the exciting part about it is that we've discovered something here. Um, so it's active. It's rugged. Um, and we're going to sample it in a way that it is, uh, you know, maybe wouldn't have been optimum had we known all that. But we'll figure out how to make it work. Great engineers. So this is the sampling device up in here. This is called the uh, sample head. This looks like uh, kind of the size of an air filter on a car, if you've ever worked on a car. Um, so it's, uh, it has a uh, um, uh, uh, compressed air canister. You'll see it in a minute. So it goes down to the surface, and it touches compressed air, blows regolith up inside. There you can see it. Um, blow up inside the sample canister here, fills it up, then the spacecraft, uh, it just, as, as we said, it just touches and goes. There's a, uh, a compliance device inside the, um, inside the robotic arm, comes back up, it puts the, the sample um, canister inside the um, return capsule. Um, this return capsule is then um, released as we come back to the Earth. The spacecraft will go off in a different direction, and this will come back and it um, does a similar re-entry. Um, to what we do at uh, Mars, you know, burns up, a, partially burns up the aeroshell as it um, goes through the uh, atmosphere, uh, parachutes deploy, and this is actually in Utah. It's not actually on Mars, even though it probably looks a little like Mars. Um, lands, and then we grab that and we take the sample back to a curation facility. The advantage of sample return, I'll just say, um, sample return is, is, a, is a kind of the, uh, not the final step, because the final step would be to actually put somebody on the surface of a body and look at it with the, your eyes and your instruments. But sample return is kind of the, the, the final step of a robotic exploration platform. Um, because what you can do first is look at it from a distance with a telescope, or as I mentioned with Mariner, you can look at the, at, at the global extent of a dust storm, for instance. Um, then you can do more detailed mapping from orbit. You can go down and then you can do some in situ science. So first you start with remote science. Then you do some in situ science with instruments similar to what we're doing on InSight right now. And then you bring a sample back. The advantage of bringing a sample back, like we'll do here with OSIRIS-REx, is that you can now take it into a lab and you can know what your labs look like here. I'll bet you a lot of money that the mass spectrometers and the, uh, and the telescopes and everything that you have in your labs here at Caltech are a lot bigger than this, which is the size of an instrument we can fly to another planet. So by bringing it back, um, dissecting it, um, sectioning it, um, examining it, um, we can learn a lot more from a sample here on Earth than we ever could in situ. As a matter of fact, the Apollo samples the Apollo samples that came back more than 50 years ago, we're still learning from the Apollo samples of what happened on the moon, or what the moon uh, uh, looks like, what it was like by, uh, because of the uh, technology of instrumentation here on Earth has improved so much. So, a sample return mission, we love those. Unfortunately, we can't bring back samples from everything, so uh, we send things out and we still do um, kind of the further out you go, the, uh, the, the more um, uh, remote sensing, sort of, so to speak, is the, is the science that you can do. I'm not sure if any of your Enceladus missions are actually bringing back a sample of the plume. Um, I will tell you, I actually have a sample of the Enceladus plume right here. These folks gave me this great water bottle. They claim that this water inside here came from the Enceladus plume. Anybody here believe that? No. But it's a great water bottle. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so now I, I won't ever forget my experience here. But anyway, um, Enceladus is one step out. It's, uh, be, it's, it's Saturn, obviously, before Saturn is Jupiter in the solar system. Um, so here's Juno. It's our latest mission that's, uh, that's there right now. Um, Juno is a mission, and um, one of the things that uh, I guess is near and dear to y'all's heart this week <laughs> is how big your mission is. Uh, New Frontiers missions, I'll just say, are, it, it, NASA's been fantastic. Discovery, Explorers, New Frontiers, these are mission lines that NASA has kept going for a number of years. The Explorers started in the 80s, the Discovery started in the 90s, the New Frontiers mission started in the 00s. Um, and those are missions where 
a principal investigator, somebody from an institution like Caltech or UCLA or, or someplace, I think uh, Scott Bolton on this one is from Southwest Research Institute, um, comes up with an idea and engages an engineering team, engages a NASA center, engages the budgetary people in Washington, and wins the opportunity to do a mission. So Scott um, uh, helped uh, with all of his science compadres to come up with the, uh, the Juno concept. Juno is a spacecraft that is a, uh, uh, a spinner. Um, so you, you all know there's sort of two ways to do a spacecraft. One is what we call three axis stabilized, just kind of f does like you and I would do. It, it, it doesn't spin, um, but it has to control its own momentum. A uh, spinner, much like a football, much like any kind of your undergraduate education will show you it's a stable uh, angular momentum vector. And uh, so the spinning uh, axis of this is along the, uh, along the line from the uh, spacecraft to the Earth which is um, where it communicates. And then of course the sun is also then seen by the solar arrays, which is quite nice for an outer planet's mission that the sun and the earth are always in the same direction. Not so easy for an inner planet mission like uh, Mercury or Venus. Uh, but uh, for this, the sun and the earth line are similar. This um, uh, spins um, out here. You can't really see it on this picture, but there's a magnetometer out here. Um, and this is primarily a fields and particles um, uh, mission that's measuring the high energy um, environment around Jupiter. You can see some of the, uh, this is a, a picture of looking down uh, through the um, uh, outer layer of, this, of the um, atmosphere um, down below to see, and what you can see is that the bands that, is seen, that are seen so uh, visibly here um, in the cloud tops the bands extend down into, um, uh, down into the uh, uh, subsurface layer. Uh, I'm using surface as the visible surface of the atmosphere. It's a little unclear what Jupiter's surface would actually be. We, we haven't gone there yet. We did actually with Galileo back in the day, we sent a probe um, into, the, uh, into the atmosphere of Galileo and it went down to, uh, I think it was like 50 bars or something like that. Um, anyway, it was... Uh, uh, but it didn't get to the surface because we don't know if it's there. Um, so anyway, uh, so there's, there's Juno, uh, second New Frontiers mission. New Frontiers now are about a billion dollars. So uh, I don't know how your Enceladus mission is uh, stacking up against a billion dollars, but um, that typically includes the launch vehicle, um, sometimes includes the mission operations phase. Um, big thing about Juno is it's the first solar powered mission to Ju to Jupiter. You know, solar cells are kind of interesting because, you know, they obviously produce electricity. We use them on the Earth all the time. But on the Earth and in Earth orbit, they're at a certain, like, 1 AU. The, the distance from the uh, Sun doesn't change very much. But out at uh, Jupiter, um, it's uh, 5 AU, so it's a 25th of the intensity, and it's also very cold. So the performance of a solar array is different, um, and being able to engineer that solar array to do two different kind of regimes or a whole range of regimes from the Earth out to Jupiter. It's kind of a trick that uh, we at Lockheed Martin have learned and we're pretty proud of that. Um, you will notice that Tom's mission though used an RTG. One of the things that we, we know, we're pretty sure the solar insulation um, out at uh, um, 550 AU would be so small that we can't use solar power there. <laughs> uh, so uh, here's some of the um, uh, key dates. We're through the 19th perijove. We'll have about 50 um, orbits. We were supposed to end at the end of uh, 2017, but the mission has obviously been extended. One of the great things about these missions is if, if, you, if the spacecraft survives, um, you wind up with a lot more science than you ever banked on. Cassini, for instance, went from um, uh, 04 to, I guess, what was it, two, three years ago? Uh, no, just last year that it went in. It was the, uh, uh, the grand finale. And then um, Jupiter, Juno has obviously lasted longer than it was supposed to as well. Opportunity, another one lasted longer. And there's all kinds of data. So uh, another Mars mission, just real quick, I'll talk to you about. Um, this is uh, one that came from the Mars Scout program line. Mars Scout since got absorbed into Discovery, but it's basically the half a billion dollars for the total mission price. Here's the spacecraft. This is inside the Lockheed Martin uh, test chambers. Um, you can see the solar array here, and there's a magnetometer. Um, 
Juno's, or excuse me, Maven's an interesting mission because um, it didn't really have any cameras. It was a, 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 a mission that was designed to study the atmosphere. Um, it went into an elliptical orbit at Mars, so um, quite far out from the, from the um, uh, center uh, so that it could measure the um, external or the outer part of the atmosphere. One of the big mysteries about Mars, I mentioned that you can do a lot of in situ science. You can uh, look at the surface of Mars from, uh, from near or far. You can do uh, different kinds of gamma ray. You can do uh, um, atmospheric constituent measurements from the surface. You could do mass spectrometry. Um, but here, what we did with this was we, we needed to understand the nature of the upper atmosphere um, because the potential future of the Earth could go one of two ways. We could look more like Venus in the future. It could be hot and you know, really unpleasant that way, or it could be no atmosphere and, uh, and, and kind of cold, um, unpleasant that way. So right now we're kind of on the Earth in the Goldilocks zone. I would say that, that, that Mars is obviously too cold to, uh, for, for uh, current survival. But why is it that cold? Why doesn't it have, a, have an atmosphere? The theory is that the magnetic field um, went away when the uh, when this, um, uh, core essentially froze or solidified. And once the magnetic field was gone, then the solar wind stripped away the atmosphere of Mars. So to prove that or verify that theory or improve upon that theory, um, a PI from uh, University of Colorado, Bruce Joukowsky, came up with the idea of a mission that measured the upper atmosphere and measured the atmospheric escape. So we, uh, we built the spacecraft. Um, this is a similar one to many of the others I showed on that first chart in terms of some of the functionality, the brains, the eyes, that sort of thing. Um, had some uh, antennas for uh, radio wave sensing. Um, this is a uh, fields and particles instrument. Um, we did this for Goddard. This was Goddard's first Mars mission, first planetary mission, which is uh, Goddard loves it. Um, JPL is not so happy they have a competitor, but hey, competition's good. Um, no one from JPL here, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, the, uh, the aero braking, which is uh, started in February, we're almost done with aero braking. I'll mention uh, aero braking just really quick because it's kind of a neat engineering um, skill that we've developed over the years. Magellan, I mentioned, was at one of those first missions that went to Venus. It did radar mapping of the surface of Venus uh, back in the 80s. Um, at the end of its mission, you know, engineers, the scientists, uh, people with money, funding agencies, they take more, they take more risk as a mission is uh, after it's done uh, with its primary objectives. So one of the things that we did with uh, the Magellan mission was we said, you know, it's in an elliptical orbit. Why not dip down into the atmosphere, get closer to the surface, and let the atmospheric drag um, reduce the orbit? So we took it from a a, uh, an elliptical orbit down to a uh, circular orbit um, at the end of its mission. After we had proved that capability, we actually baselined that as a, as a, as a mission enabler, because as you know from a mass point of view, it doesn't take as much delta V to go into an elliptical orbit as it does to go into a circular orbit. So you go to Mars, you get to take more science because you go into an elliptical orbit, but then you have to dip down and arrow break, bring the si bring the um, the apoapse down to the uh, planet or closer to the planet's surface. So we did that with Mars Global Surveyor. We did that with Mars Climate Orbiter. We did that with uh, um, Odyssey. Uh, we did that with Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. We weren't actually planning to do that with Maven. However, we always knew that it was a possibility for us to do that. And so um, what Maven did um, is uh, it started its aero braking after its science mission was done. And the reason why it's doing that is in a, in, a, in a lower orbit, less distance from a surface rover. So Maven will be part of the fundamental uh, uh, relay infrastructure for the Mars 2020 mission. Mars 2020 launches in 2020 um, and it'll go to Mars. Thank you for laughing. My wife tells me I should keep my day job. Um, the uh, Mars, will, it'll, it'll land and drive around on the surface. It's a rover very similar to Curiosity. Its mission is to grab samples and uh, stash or cache them away so that they can be picked up by a Mars sample return mission in the future. Um, but it doesn't send its data, it could send a tiny bit of data directly back to the Earth, but it sends its data back primarily through a set of relay satellites. 
we luckily are enough uh, are, uh, are operating those relay satellites because they were science satellites to begin with and now they're relay satellites. So that's where MAVEN fits in, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, being part of the future infrastructure. So I think we heard about repurposing. Uh, that was a word that uh, Tom used. One of the things that's wonderful about engineering and science is that you can take something that you expected to use for one reason, you use it, you, you do what you wanted, and then you learn something else. So again, you'll always get, you're always gonna learn something from your data. Someday your computer with artificial intelligence is gonna learn things from your data that you didn't predict as well. Lucy, I'll talk about this mission just a little bit. Um, Lucy, uh, we got selected in uh, 2017 to build that, so we're uh, between PDR and CDR right now. Um, Lucy is a mission that'll go out to the uh, Trojan asteroids. I already told you the source of its name. Um, Trojan asteroids are pretty cool. This is actually what I studied when I was your age. I studied orbits, orbit mechanics. I thought these things flying around were just the most fascinating things in the world. Um, the orbit mechanics of the, uh, of, uh, the Sun-Jupiter uh, sort of three-body system is such that there is an uh, equilibrium point. Um, here you can't really see it because it's moving around too fast, but if you look at the restricted three-body problem, there's an equilibrium point at what's called L4 and L5 Lagrange points. Um, at those L4 and L5 Lagrange points, um, in our real, honest to gosh, solar system, um, there's a lot of asteroids that have co collected. We've known about these for a long time from ground-based telescopes, um, and, uh, and now we've got uh, on-orbit survey telescopes that have uh, helped us understand these, um, but we've never visited them. So we're gonna visit these asteroids, and one of the reasons why is because, just like with Bennu, we're gonna find something that we didn't expect. Um, we're gonna go on a trajectory that sort of loops back and forth between several of these. I think there's uh, six different flybys. Um, we'll fly by these asteroids, and these are sort of the primordial uh, things that started from the solar system formation. When the solar system first formed, and I'm not a scientist, so I won't, get, I won't say too much uh, detail about this, but basically it was a, it was a, a dust, uh, most everything in a plane, all rotating. Um, the planets coalesced out of that, the large planets, the small planets, the, there was a lot of dust left, uh, dust that then coalesced into asteroids and in some cases formed itself into homogeneous bodies like planets, um, in some cases not. Um, and whether it's a dwarf planet or an asteroid is a big debate. You can get the Pluto crowd all excited about, about that debate. Um, so there's a whole class of things that didn't get um, class that didn't um, wind up in a planet. Um, Kuiper Belt objects, like I mentioned, Pluto and that New Horizons mission is learning a lot about Kuiper Belt objects, which are very far out. They would probably Kuiper Belt objects would be probably down here, you know, that far out from the sun. But closer to home, at 5 AU, we have the Trojans. So we've proven with Juno that we can use a solar-powered mission. So why not? Let's do a solar-powered mission and go visit these asteroids. So that's what we're doing. We'll, uh, we'll launch in 2021 and then um, do uh, Earth flybys uh, in uh, 2022 and on. Um, and then the first Trojan encounter, I hope you can see this, is in August of 2027. I'm sorry you can't see anything beyond me, but no. <laughs> trust me, it's there, 2027. Um, and then the end of the mission is in 2033. Um, so another exciting mission and another opportunity for us to, uh, to do our job. And one of the things, one of the reasons why it's exciting, you know, 2033, that's a long time. Well, what will we do between now and then? Well, we'll actually fly these things. You guys are familiar with what happens in uh, JPL with flying things. You've seen that on, the, uh, uh, on your televisions, on your web feeds, whatever, on your, uh, um, uh, as, as, the, as the planet uh, or as the uh, lander goes into the uh, seven minutes of terror, there's a lot of folks watching. Well, that's, that's the exciting part. But on a day-to-day -day basis, engineers both at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, in the case of, uh, of many of the Mars missions, at Goddard, and then of course in Denver at uh, Mar Lockheed Martin, um, we actually sit in a mission support area. Um, we're actually flying um, eight missions right now for NASA. And this is the stuff where on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, well, they don't get much ho for holidays because you, know, you never know what's gonna happen. Over the Christmas holidays, this was great. Over the Christmas holidays, InSight 
um, started to deploy its instruments. OSIRIS-REx arrived at the asteroid and went into orbit. Juno had some Perry Jove passes, um, and we got ready for air braking on MAVEN. Of course, Hubble and Spitzer are out there watching the solar system and watching the universe. Um, I got a couple of pictures on that. Um, Odyssey is still doing relay even after um, it arrived in Mars in 2002. It's now 19. 17 years later, it's still, uh, it's still um, uh, functioning properly. Um, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that's where we take all the pictures of the uh, recurring slope lineae, they call them. It looks like sort of uh, dark spots on the surface or on the side of craters. Um, lots of uh, interesting stuff going on. So these folks that are in the mission support area, oh my God, what a fun job. So that's something that uh, we, we wind up, you know, as an engineer, you wind up sort of circulating back between operations and design and engineering. Some of us, like me, I was, went on an escape trajectory, went off to business development after doing a few of those things. But the, the amount of work and interesting, exciting stuff that you can do in this, in this business is phenomenal. So you can see, uh, let's see, if this, is, this is what the mission support area looked like maybe 15 years ago. This is what it looked like when MAVEN um, arrived at Mars. Anyway, um, so I'll talk a little bit about Hubble, and this is just really for completeness. You guys, I'm sure, have seen way more Hubble pictures than, uh, than um, you know, than I could ever show. But Hubble has really taught us so much about the universe. We can look back so far, not as far back as WMAP or, uh, or, um, or the Cosmic Background Explorer back, I mean, in terms of time, but we're seeing things that are so far away with the Hubble Space Telescope and, and learning so much about galaxies with the uh, deep field camera, things like that. Um, it's again a mission that lasts, has lasted a long time. We launched in 1990. I remember when I was your age, when I was in graduate school, it seemed like the Hubble telescope was never going to launch. And then it launched and it had a little bit of an issue with the mirror, which was fixed, and it's now been going on and been serviced five times in space. Great mission, um, and so we're still flying it out of our, uh, out of our um, operations at Goddard. Um, Spitzer Space Telescope, this one when it um, started its life was called the uh, uh, CERTIF, um, Space Infrared Telescope Facility. Um, CERTIF and uh, Hubble were part of what NASA started in the, um, kind of started in the 70s and 80s and really launched. It was a part of a program called the Great Observatories. NASA launched four observatories that were um, CERTIF, which was IR, Hubble, which was basically optical and a little bit of the near infrared, um, a uh, mission called AXAF, which uh, later on I think was renamed Chandra, it was an X-ray telescope, and then uh, the Gamma Ray Observatory, which was obviously in gamma rays. So the four great observatories spanned the electromagnetic band from one end to the other, or as much as we could at the time. Um, and one of the things that we're doing that NASA's talking about now is well, what's next? So the next ones are James Webb Space Telescope, which will launch next year. There's one called WFIRST, which is the IR in FIRST is for infrared. Um, and then there's uh, others in the other bands. And the reason why we're doing this is because, guess what? We learned a lot. But the thing about learning is that all it really prepares you for is the ability to ask better questions. So we've got so many more questions about the universe than we could ever answer from James Webb or from from uh, Hubble or any of this data. So it's great to learn, it's great to be part of it, but never forget that the things that Tom and Henry talked about, that's in our future and there's always so much more to learn. So I sort of went off on a little rant there. Let me talk a little bit more about the details of Spitzer. This is one of the most exciting things. Um, this is the TRAPPIST-1 system. Um, and Spitzer also is in an extended mission. It ran out of the cryogenic fluid. So cryogenic fluid, um, liquid nitrogen or liquid helium or liquid uh, oxygen is used to keep the focal plane cold. That's an engineering necessity to be able to see in very, uh, very cold things. Um, so uh, it ran out of cryogen. It's in, in what's called its warm mission now. But even so, it was able to, with the help of, a, of, of an observatory on the Earth, which found through sort of the old, what's now the classical, a star is wobbling technique, 
they found evidence of another solar system around another star. We were able to then take Spitzer, point it at that spot in space, and find evidence of this system called the TRAPPIST-1 system. Now this is a really interesting system, and these images are just artists' renditions. We don't have images of exoplanets yet, someday. Um, maybe with a, a CubeSat mission, gravitational lensing, something like that. But anyway, this TRAPPIST-1 system, all of this fits in this little tiny spot between uh, Mercury and uh, the Sun. Um, but we think there are um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven planets in, in there um, orbiting around uh, its Sun. So this is exciting, kind of lets us know that uh, the Earth isn't alone anyway. We still don't know if we as humans and life are alone. We still don't know that yet, but that's a big question that's still out there. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna take one quick left turn and talk really quickly about Orion. So remember I said you got CubeSats with tiny little sensors, and then you got a human space flight with, with 200 pound pink breathing eyeball sensors and brains. Well, that's the human space flight side of things. And we're in the process of doing all that. In 2014, we flew uh, what was called Engineering Flight Test 1. Um, we landed in, um, uh, in the Pacific Ocean off of San Diego. Um, we took that same capsule, brought it back. We put it on the White House lawn. Uh, in, oops, in 2019, we're gonna um, fly. This is called uh, uh, Ascent Abort. Um, where this is a small uh, launch vehicle, essentially an ICBM core. It'll go up into the atmosphere very fast. And while it's, uh, um, while it's accelerating, the, um, the spacecraft will be pulled away. This is the spacecraft to uh, launch vehicle interface. And this piece up here is called the launch abort system, very similar to what was used, well, similar in looks anyway, to what was used back in the uh, Apollo program to potentially pull the astronauts off. These uh, thrusters up here will pull the spacecraft away from the launch vehicle. So we're trying to test that we can make sure the astronauts are safe. So that actually, this test in uh, 19 will be, uh, we think, in uh, end of June. So it's only a couple of months away before we do this ascent abort two. EM-1 is in uh, 2020. EM-2, this is again the first flight of astronauts to the um, moon since the 70s. It'll be in 2022. Um, and then EM3, I'm not showing anything here unless I, nope, my animation isn't there. EM3 will um, begin uh, bringing up pieces of what NASA calls their gateway that will be in orbit about the moon. It'll use the extra capacity of the Space Launch System SLS rocket um, to take up pieces of a gateway and essentially build up a, um, a permanent human presence at the moon. So this is what EM-1 will look like. It's actually uh, a, a fun mission if you're an orbit guy. It goes into, uh, it launches, it um, raises the orbit a little bit. Um, we make sure that we're okay. And then if we're okay, we go on a translunar injection out here. We fly by the moon, um, go into what we call a distant retrograde orbit. That's a uh, about a 70,000 kilometer um, distance from the center of the moon, so that's uh, the, hence the distant part. Retrograde because it, is, it goes backwards. As seen from the moon, it goes backwards, retrograde, not in the same direction that the, uh, that the body is rotating, um, the moon is rotating. So then it stays in that um, uh, for about seven days, although the actual duration of that might be seven, might be 21 days, depending on where in the actual launch window we, uh, we launch. Um, it, uh, then we'll do a gravity assist with a burn and come back to the Earth. So that's the mission for uh, the, um, the EM-1. And then uh, I guess that's my last slide. Um, so I'll just say thank you. <laughs> and then open it up to questions.